good evening, everybody. Good morning for those in the US. Uh, another lovely evening. We look forward to uh, hearing Swamiji and his thoughts about uh, Rikhi Agaman and the teachings of uh, Swami Satyananji. So before we start, Swamiji, over to you. So let us begin with uh, heart. Please sit comfortably, hands on your knees, or chin mudra, the head, neck, shoulders, back in a straight line, eyes and mouth gently closed. Bring your awareness to your eyebrow center, brumadhya, and at the brumadhya, visualize the image of a flame, a jyoti. And maintaining your awareness on this experience, we shall chant the mantra Om three times together, taking in a deep breath. Oh. Oh. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahavir Yankaravahai Tejas Vina Vadita Mastu Ma Ved Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Hill Hari Hi Om Hari Om Tatsat Gently rub your palms against each other. Place them on the closed eyes. Experience the warmth radiating from the palms to your eyes, to the brain, to the whole body. Then gently move your palms away. Open your eyes. Hurry over. Thank you, Swamiji. So today being uh, so close to uh, 23rd September, the topic chosen for today um, is dawn of the new spiritual consciousness, uh, starting with the day that uh, Shri Swami Satyananji arrived um, at Rikhya and uh, the steps that he took uh, relentlessly post that. Uh, but before we get there, uh, Swamiji, there was a few questions uh, regarding spirituality in general that uh, some of us uh, wanted to ask of you. So before we talk about Rikhya Agman, uh, can we take up uh, questions, a little questions on uh, spirituality? Sure. So um, uh, some of us who, joy, who regularly join the Mantra Booster session wanted to know in specifically, uh, why do we need uh, spirituality? Isn't it, uh, you know, as long as we are fulfilling our life, uh, purpose, our responsibilities, so to say, of our life, aren't we walking the spiritual path? By taking out time for spirituality, are we not uh, giving up our responsibilities in some way? That's a very nice question. Unfortunately, it's a very old question also. Many people have asked this and yet People don't get the answer to this. Let me try and share what I have understood about this. And I think uh, if this thought, this question comes in the minds of people, it is very good. Because it indicates that people are looking at their aims in life, their Focus their goal. So, therefore, it is very good 
that we have this question and it is very relevant also. You see, the question about spirituality and its relevance comes because we are understanding it or trying to understand it from the English word spirituality. But in Sanskrit, the word is Adhyatma. That is coming from the Atma. To understand this better, I feel it is essential to step back a bit and observe the progress of philosophy and the methodology of that progress. Every civilization is known by the philosophical ramifications it has. Much of the Western society, what we see today, derives its philosophical basis from the Greek philosophy. And the Greeks spoke of four elements, those which can be perceived. You can perceive earth, you can see water, you can see air, fire, you can perceive air. So these were the four elements. There was no fifth element. However, in the Indian philosophy, there is a fifth element, the element of space. That element brings in the higher dimension. Yeah, so it should be, it should be kind of go with the, you know, the ones which are high. Over a lot of time, people evolved, the society evolved. Initially, we were like cavemen. We were working with instincts and slowly there was a progress. Higher centers started developing. And we started looking at the world. However, the Indian system dates back to many thousands of years, many millennia. And over this period, People realized, not everybody, some people realized that we look at the body. After a lot of thought, there comes, oh, there is something known as the mind. Not very clear what it is, but there is something called the mind. Today, the Western society is at that level, body, mind. 50 years ago, they were speaking only of the body. Now, they say, no, it's not the body, it's a body-mind. In medicine, they speak of psychosomatic disorders and somatopsychic disorders. This started about 50-60 years ago. Till before that, it was only the body. But in the Indian system, there is the discovery that there is a dimension beyond the mind also. That is the dimension of the Atma. And the existence of Atma is the most important. It is something like the essence is the Atma. You have the car, you have the driver of the car, but Neither the car nor the driver of the car is capable of taking the car in any direction until and unless the passenger in the car, the owner of the car does not give an instruction, I want to go in this direction. The car nor its driver will move anywhere. It's not a question of can or cannot, will not because they have not got the instructions. Once that instruction is given, then the owner sits back 
and reads and does whatever else, then it is the driver and the car who have to navigate along. The same is the situation. You have the rath, you have the rathi, and you have the person who is sitting in the rath. You have the rath, the sarathi, and the person who is sitting. That person sitting is the atma. And then they realized that it is from there that things are coming. And of course, then there was an entire long list of analysis and experiments and uh, everything. And this knowledge was distilled. Initially, it appears that these two streams, spirituality is one different direction and materialism is another different direction. And it appears that East is East and West is West and never shall the twain meet. But that is not so. Because we are all finally part of that one individuality. If my right hand is being pulled to one side, how is it my left hand is not going to be affected? If I have a tree and I take care of the leaves of the tree, if I take care of the twigs of the tree, I take care of the fruits of the tree. I take care of the flowers of the tree. I take care of the trunk of the tree. And that is all I do. What will happen? No matter how well I take care of the tree, the tree will wither away. Until and unless I don't nourish the roots, which are not visible. There is nothing visible there. Oh, jamin ke niche kya hai? Kuch nahi hai. Jo jamin ke niche hai, wahi sab cheez hai. That is the essence. If you don't water the roots, if you don't nourish the roots, the tree is going to wither away and die away. This awareness is known as spirituality. Now tell me, if the tree of life starts withering away, will you be able to fulfill your duties? Will you be able to perform your actions? No, you will not be able to. If you do not have money in your pocket, you will not be able to do any activity. You need to have money in your pocket to purchase things. In the same way, you need to nourish your roots. And the roots, the essence, the crux of human existence is the Atma. So acknowledging the Atma and working with it is what Adhyatma is all about. So when you understand Adhyatma in this light, then there is no discrepancy, there is no dissonance, there is no conflict. It is all very clear. Spirituality is that science which nourishes the roots of human existence. And doing so, you can utilize your capabilities. You can increase your capabilities to whichever degree you want. And then from an ordinary human being, you can become a sublime superman. You become a genius. And when you become a genius, whichever field it is, you will shine. That is the essence of spirituality. And when you understand this to be the basis of spirituality, then there is no conflict. In fact, when you forget this, then the understanding gets clouded. And when the understanding gets clouded, then you are not able to perform your duties properly. Therefore, I would say that if you really are interested in performing your commitments and responsibilities and duties properly, then it is extremely essential for you to pay heed to the spiritual principles which nurture life. And yoga is the practical science which teaches us how to nurture. That is why I believe it is extremely essential that we understand spirituality in this dimension and have no guilt or hang-ups. Oh, 
I am being attracted towards spirituality. Perhaps I am. No, there is no need for this guilt. And also, if anybody is using spirituality as an excuse to run away from our duties, he or she is wrong. Spirituality is a method by which you embrace life in its totality from the sublime to the mundane, everything. Thank you so much, Swamiji, on that beautiful explanation. Uh, just a uh, you know, sequential thought on the same. You said by embracing spirituality, we can become superhumans. We can become a genius. But there are a lot of people who claim that isn't uh, it in, you know, by hard work. I share if I study more math, I'll become very good at math. So do we really, uh, in that context, uh, you know, how does spirituality uh, fit in? I don't understand your question. It is the same way that you say, oh, I have to cut this tree and I have an axe and I'm going to keep on hammering the axe and hammering the axe. And I tell you, please wait, sharpen the blade and then go. No, 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 I don't have any time. Let me keep on hammering, keep on hammering. I, I don't want to waste any time. Does it make sense? No. Because after hammering the axe for some time, the blade is going to get blunt. You need to sharpen. Otherwise, you are wasting your efforts. Yes, you must work. And spirituality does not tell you not to work. In fact, this is the question which was asked in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjun said that you are speaking of spirituality and is speaking of all these higher sciences. But then why are you asking me to do all these dangerous and uh, you know shuddering activity of war and killing all these people? I don't want to do any activity. Do you know what Lord Krishna told him? Not even for a moment can a person live without karma. Karma is there for everybody, either in action, either in mind, either in thought or speech. You do karma all the time. So therefore, I believe we have to understand this in this context. If we need to upgrade our axe to a motor, you know, you have these chainsaws. If I say, please keep the axe down and take a chainsaw, it is going to take 15 minutes extra, but you are going to cut that tree much faster. If I say, it doesn't matter if you have the same uh, chainsaw uh, or same axe, but at least sharpen it, you are going to step back a bit, but then you are going to be more effective. So we have to understand and we have to know, do you want to work hard or do you want to work smart? Do you have an eye on the result or do you want to show that you are working? If you have an eye on the result, if you want to be efficient, if you want to be smart, if you want to achieve those goals, then there is no other way than to embrace yoga, embrace spiritual. So, so Swamiji, on that note, what is the difference between yoga and spirituality? To my mind, there is no difference between yoga and spirituality. What is the difference between the heads of a coin and the tails of a coin? There are two sides of the same coin. Because... Today we feel that yoga is something which will give me a nice body. But that is not what is the aim of yoga. Yoga works on the body, the mind, the emotions and all the dimensions. Having a good body is only one aspect of yoga. Spirituality is the culmination. Let us say for some time, we are not speaking of spirituality. We are speaking of tapping the hidden and untapped potential which is within 
every individual for a few moments forget the term spirituality because it is misunderstood say you are upgrading your capabilities say you are discovering the qualities you have say you are bringing in more abilities so if that is the case the knowledge of the abilities and how they happen that is adhyatma and the practical methodology to do it is yoga so therefore both are two sides of the same coin there is no difference between them makes sense ma'am thank you so much so uh, with that uh, we can move on to the topic for the day uh, i request if anybody else has any questions that they would like to ask on the topic for the day or in general you can put them in the chat window and we will accordingly give time permitting we'll take it up today or we will schedule another in, in conversation uh, regarding those so uh, swami ji topic for today dawn of a new spiritual consciousness uh, what do we mean by that i think we need to understand when we speak about dawn it does not mean that something new has come up dawn means the sun was there earlier the sun set and now the sun is rising again this knowledge was there earlier and this knowledge reached its pinnacle its zenith and it translated into the entire society and the society was uplifted that was the age which was the golden age of india and then over a period of time slowly 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 there was the sunset and in 1963 swami satyananda established bihar school of yoga because his guru swami shivanand ji gave him the mandate spread the message of yoga from door to door and shore to shore and after traveling the length and breadth of the country swami ji realized shri swami ji realized that the need of the time is to present the old wine in a new bottle and accordingly he made lot of studies and presented yoga in the scientific terminology of today's times the terminology utilized in yoga is scientific but that terminology existed thousands of years ago the language today is different so he actually made made a bridge so that we can today understand what that is there and he introduced the scientific aspect to yoga for 25 years he went round the entire globe speaking about yoga expounding principles of yoga and when i say yoga i don't mean asana and pranayam i mean yoga in all its aspects and then in 1988 he gave it all up at the peak of its abilities swami ji left munger he handed it over to his disciple swami narendranand ji his successor and then he left with two dhotis and he was he had very clear intention long time ago i was given a mandate and i have fulfilled it i have also given the next generation to take it forward now what is it that is there in me it for me what adesh for me and he was going across the length and breadth of the country at the different tirth kshetras 
and at Nasik Trambakeshwar, he did his Chaturmas. And he had a very clear vision. He had the vision of the place Vikhya. In deep state of meditation, he saw this place and he heard the word Chita Bhumau. In the scriptures, Devghar is known as the Chita Bhumi of Sati. I'm sure you would know the story. Sati was the daughter of Daksha, the first wife of Shiva. And she immolated herself in the Yajna fire. Shiva was wild. And he took her corpse, put it on his shoulder, and in grief, he was roaming the entire world. The whole world was quaking in fear. And then Mahavishnu with his chakra cut away different parts of the body which fell and became the Shakti Pithas. In the end, her heart, chest remained which was cremated at Devghar. And Devghar became the Chitab. So it was at this place and in this area he was given a vision. And he sent his disciple Swami Satya Sanghananji to find this place out. She found this place out and on 23rd September 1989 Swamiji reached Rikhya. 23rd September is a very powerful day. It is the day of the equinox. The day and night are equal. They are in balance. The entire nature is in balance. And at exact 12 o'clock, Swamiji reached Vikhya. This date, this Muhurta is celebrated as the Rikhya Agaman Muhurta. Because it was not the Agaman of an individual, but it was Agaman of an energy. Swami Satyananda came to Rikhya for his personal sadhana. He was told what sadhana he had to do. And perhaps he thought that is what he has to do. But divine powers had a different plan. Through him, everything came up. Swamiji has said many times, Rikhya was not his plan. But when he saw that things are happening, he realized that it might not be his plan, but he was a medium to a divine plan. That divine plan was enacting and he said, whatever is your desire, if I am a medium for your desire, so be it. You gave me the Adesh, establish yoga, I did it. And now whatever is happening, so be it. At Rikhya, Swamiji was always in Ekant. It was Swami Satya Sanghananji who was at the forefront doing everything. And over here at Rikhya, what unfolded was a different understanding. By 90s, yoga had started becoming fashionable. No, yoga has started being known. It had still not become fashionable. It was only in the new millennium that it started getting fashionable slowly. People started understanding, no, yoga is a science. It's not a part of religion. And people were practicing it very sincere. But many yoga practitioners, aspirants, they would come to one level and get locked over there. It was as if there was a plateau, there was a glass ceiling, and they were unable to go beyond. Whatever they do, they got stuck there. They did not know what to do. They did not even, they did not know what was happening. And at Rikhya, Swamiji un, 
failed the next phase of the development in 1963 he had declared that yoga will emerge as a powerful world culture we all know about it because that was the need of the times yoga is a subject by which we can manage our mind but that is not the only thing we did asan we did pranayam what we see today only one aspect that is not everything there is much much more and what was seen was that Swamiji saw perhaps that the future needs some other tools also. People need to go deeper. The next step. And that is what unveiled itself at Rikhya. At Rikhya, Swamiji never spoke about asana and pranayam and dhyan and dharana and all of that. No. He, had, he has spoken so many times very clearly that at Rikhya, he will speak only about God. He spoke about Bhakti. And when we speak about Bhakti, then immediately there are alarm bells. Oh my God, we are talking about religion. Oh my God, there is something about superstition. Oh my God, there is something about blind faith. Swamiji clarified, Bhakti is not faith, blind faith. Bhakti is not superstition. Bhakti is not rituals. Bhakti is a wave in the brain. It is an approach in the brain by which some changes take place. And those changes lead us to the higher dimensions. I am capable of many activities. My iPhone is capable of many activities. But if I have not activated the different apps, my iPhone maybe is just being used as a paperweight because I don't know how to use that iPhone. What an irony. Your phone is a very powerful instrument, but just because you don't know how to use it, you're using it only as a paperweight. Oh, it's nothing useful, but okay, I can use it as a paper. No. Bhakti is that science by which you can activate those aspects. Secondly, you will see about 60 years ago, the emotions of people were more stable. Their minds were restless, but emotions were a bit more stable. Today, Emotions are extremely volatile. You just have to look around you. Look at the newspapers. Look at it. I don't need to explain. And Bhakti is one of the most powerful way by which you can channelize these emotions. Mind you, not block these emotions. Channelize them. And when we speak of channelizing them, how do we do that? To do that, we have the definition of bhakti, which is very important. Bhakti is defined in Sanskrit as bhajat sevayam. Service becomes the first step of bhakti. Just doing puja, archana, that is not bhakti. No. That's a misunderstanding. Bhakti is trying to connect ourselves to a higher reality. My phone is inactive. It is not connecting to that tower. I need to connect it to that tower. That process of connecting, pairing, as we call it. If you have got a Bluetooth device, you do pairing of the devices. What is that? You can understand that to be bhakti. And to do that, what do you have to do? Do not please close your eyes and sit down. No. That is not what is doing. To do that, the first thing is seva, service. And what is service? We have heard about karma yoga. 
So maybe seva and karma yoga are the same thing. No. Seva is one step beyond karma yoga. What you are doing for your child, you just don't do as a part of the duty. There is so much of emotion which is also attached and you make that offering. So, in addition to the duty, in addition to the perfection in action, you connect your emotions to a higher purpose. Uplifting your emotions, refining your emotions, serve, love, give. Once you start serving, then you have to unconditionally love. There is a story which Swamiji says, when Gurudev was in his Guru Ashram at Rishikesh, Swami Shivanandji, he was a doctor. And in Rishikesh in those days, lepers used to be, you know, people would come and just drop anybody with leprosy over there and walk away. So, Swami Shivanandji caught hold of a leper and brought him to the ashram and told Gurudev to take care of him. And Swamiji says that with every sentence, this leper would throw out three, four gali. He used to get annoyed. I am taking so much care of him. He's having wounds. I'm washing them. I'm taking care of him. And he's giving me bad words. I mean, no gratitude. And then Swamiji said many years later, he said, that was the lesson which was for me to learn. I will do my duty. I will love you unconditionally. What you do is your problem. That's not my problem. But I will look at you as if you are God incarnate. If my child or my parent or my closest one is ill, will I not even unflinchingly do everything needed to save that person? With the same attitude you have to do seva as if you are doing it for God or for the divine or for which, whichever thing you can connect to. And when you do that that is an unconditional love. You And then give. Give. The third thing is very difficult. All of us learn and the society also teaches take, 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 take. That is all what we know and if we have to give, oh my God, the entire philosophy start coming up. Why should I give? Is it really needed? Perhaps it can, you know, you can do it this way, you can do it that way. It is not because you are wanting to give that person a proper advice. In the disguise of that advice, you are actually protecting the desire of not wanting to give. Once at Rikhiya, it happened that Swamiji used to give cows to the people. And Swamiji got a report that somebody sold the cow. And they were all very angry. Oh, Swamiji, how can he, he, you have given him the cow? How can you? Swamiji said, what's your problem? I have given it to him. Now what he wants to do, it's his problem. I have not given it to him with conditions. I have given it unconditionally. When God gives you, does he give you with condition? Does he say that please sign on this agreement that you do this, 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 only then I give it to you? No, he gives you chappar phaad ke dete hai. How much do we misuse? But does he or she whichever way they might be. Do they ever say? No. In the same way, when we give, we give, give, give. Don't even worry. If he is doing wrong, that's his karma. He will take care of it. And sure enough, in, in a very short time, the villagers almost boycotted that person from the village. They said, Swamiji ne tumko prasad diya hai. Tum kaise bech sakte ho? He was forced to bring the cow back. Swamiji didn't do anything. It was happening. But 
स्वामी जी सेड की आई एम नॉट डूइंग इट एज एन एक्ट ऑफ चैरिटी आई एम आई डूइंग इट एज एन एक्ट ऑफ लव एंड आई एम गिविंग नो इफ यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू यूज इट प्रॉपरली योर प्रॉब्लम सो दिस दीज आर द बेसिक टेनेट्स ऑफ रिफाइनिंग योर इमोशन of stabilizing your emotion of connecting with that higher self which is inside you and when we start doing that then there is a new paradigm which starts coming up they say that when you are in love let us say because many times people say when you fall in love when you fall in love then suddenly the roses appear uh, you know more red the day is brighter everything is nice there is a spring all over heart is dancing and singing and when that is not there everything is down in the same manner when you connect like this there is joy ecstasy all over what you would be able to achieve in a hundred thousand years you are able to achieve much faster and in the same manner that when one is in love then suddenly there are new insights oh wow the world is like this world is like this so it is almost as if you are looking at the world for the first time there's a new dawn which is happening a new chapter begins in the same manner when this starts coming in our life there is the dawn of a new awareness and the beauty of the activities in rikhya the way swami ji designed it is he created it such that while we progress spiritually and also materially we will progress because we are progressing spiritually those people who are the have nots of the society they also prosper they also prosper and become samrudh not only by monetary or material possessions but also by spiritual knowledge because that energy descends and that energy showers itself on everybody it showers on us it showers on them on everybody and it transforms everybody those of you who have seen the medical camps you know there is a different energy the camps are not possible by our human endeavor there are so many shortcomings but suddenly something happens and something happens and something happens and there is a magic and before we know and even the patients feel it we have seen that and shilpa you have been witness to that absolutely swami ji i mean in the last medical camp the medical officer of the health center he came to me and said swami ji we also do many specialist camps we get you know uh, government super specialists to come and the nurse also said that we have to go actually and beg people to come super specialist has come please come and show and here you have people coming on their own how is it we are not gone begging to people hardly any uh, publicity was done but there was an energy which pulled people and as people came and as they were leaving almost all of them were in tears they felt that energy they felt a shift and they said we never have experienced something like this in life tell me would it be for those ancestral medicines which are being given me that is just the manifest thing which is being given to them but below that manifest thing there is some higher energy which comes in which touches their lives and touches our lives also 
we being so intellectualized perhaps will not be able to connect to that energy but when we become a medium of giving become a medium of that divine energy the energy descends and washes away our problems so if we want to have a shortcut to divine grace the simplest shortcut is this serve love give adjust adapt accommodate bear injury a bear insult bear injury highest sadhana highest yoga swami shivanand ji has said this he has not said asan pranayam pratyahar dharana dhyan that is the best no adjust adapt accommodate bear insult bear injury can we bear insult yes people say when you slap on one cheek you turn the other cheek but what have we seen if somebody tries to take the hand up not only we catch hold of the hand but we cut the whole hand off that is what we do do we have the strength the courage to say slap one i will give you the next that courage comes when you connect on a deeper level and when you connect on a deeper level there is a different strength which comes in which washes away everything and when that strength blooms within us then the world is a different place everything is different yes you will still go to your office you will still do your business you will still study you will still do everything which you are doing but the outlook will be different the abilities will be different the results will be different everything changes that is the dawn of a new spiritual consciousness where not only do i grow and progress but at the same time i also take care of others the way i like to understand it is reach out to connect within you reach out to those persons not as charity mind you but as seva as puja as aradhana and when you do it as puja aradhana with the sense of perfection with the sense of offering then observe there is a magic which comes in and then that magic transforms both me and that person here there is no benefactor and no beneficiary all are beneficiaries because there is only one benefactor we are all beneficiaries let us connect and while connecting i receive what i need and that person receives what that person needs when we do that then there is a different thing which comes up quality of our life quality of our activities everything changes that is the dawn of a new spiritual consciousness which for which about which shri swami ji gave a clarion call from rikhya peet that is what i was referring to as spiritual consciousness beautiful swami ji it's uh, so inspiring and yes we have felt that shift of energy in our spaces since we were associated uh, with you so thank you so much for giving us that opportunity so and uh, swami ji we all a lot of us uh, who have not met shri swami ji want to know more about him and about his days of rikya so we have a little bit time could you please uh, tell us more about him that is one question you can ask me any time and i will never say no shri swami ji came to rikhya not as a conqueror which he was he had established yoga as a science in every country in the world there was no country except swami says that his passport 
had the stamp of every country except the North Pole, South Pole and Zambia. Because at that time when he used to travel, Indians were not allowed to go to Zambia. But beyond that, every country he had gone and he had established. And he had not spoken in religious terms. He had spoken about science because yoga is scientific. Spirituality is scientific. And those were the facts. And he spoke with scientists. He spoke with astronauts. He spoke with doctors and convinced them. And then he left all that behind. And as a humble man, at the age of 67, 68, he was directed to Rikhya. And at Rikhya, he was told to do the sadhana in the burial grounds. So when it is in the burial grounds, he undertook the Panchagni sadhana. You have the fire in the front, you have fire in the left, fire behind, fire to the right, fire above. Pancha Agni, five fires. Temperatures used to go 80, 90, sometimes even 100 degrees Celsius. And he would not do this in the cold months because when it's cold, oh, we are all sit by the fire. No, it was from Makar Sankranti. 14th January to Karka Sankranti in June. Six hot months of the year. And the fire was not small. It was big blazing fire. The person who had to tend to the fire occasionally, uh, the sannyasi would have to go in and shift the wood so that after some time the fire dies down, that needs to be brought up again. So that person would wear jute gunny bags, quickly go in and change. In that five minutes, two minutes, his hands would be full of blisters. But Swamiji would be sitting there the whole day with no problem. And when he was sitting there, he was doing the sadhana, other sadhana which he was doing as if this was not enough, was repeating his Guru Mantra with every breath. Chaiso sahasra ikkiso jab. Anhat upaje ape. So, we breathe 15 times a minute, 900 times an hour, 21,600 times in 24 hours. And with every breath, he had to do his Guru Mantra. That is what he would do in his Mantra. So that was a type of sadhana which he did. And along with that, he did many other sadhanas. And he was glowing like molten copper. People who have seen him during Panchagni, oh, the Tej you could not, I mean, he, he, he was a totally different person. Those people who had seen him in Munger, his avatar in Munger and avatar in Rikhya was totally different. And in Rikhya, he said very clearly, I am the servant. I have to try and understand what is my relation with God. And he said, I found out my relation. I am his servant. Servant sits over there. If the master doesn't say anything, keeps sitting. But his ears are always there. The moment the master says, go, get this, quickly he goes, gets it, and he's waiting. That is how. Now, when the master says, do this, the servant does not say, oh, but how can I do this? This is not correct. That is not correct. That is not correct. That is what we do. But not him. Whatever Adesh he received, he would do. And he said, if I don't get an Adesh, I will not do anything. He was in complete communion. He was in the state of Atma Bhav. When he was in Panchagni, he had the vision, he saw, he experienced. Uh, there was this woman. He told Swami Satya Sanghananji, Jao, ek mahila hai, vidva hai, bachche hai, ghar jal gaya hai. 
Her house has been burnt down. She's come on the road. She has nothing. Find her. Make a house for her. And that is how things started. In his third year of Panchagni, he did. He became a Karodpati. How? In one year, he did one crore of Chapas. That was the Anushthan. And during that Anushthan, he heard the voice, take care of your neighbors as I have taken care of. And when he heard this voice, then activities started. Till that time, Swamiji said, nothing doing. I have come here for Ekan. Don't even come and disturb me. Nobody was allowed to come there. But when he got this Adesh, then activities took a different turn and welfare activities started because the situation was beyond imagination. Beyond imagination. The Mukhiya of the village who had 50 acres of land to his name, you can imagine, oh, 50 acres, that means great fellow. In his house, for four days, five days, people would not eat anything. It was not a big thing. Swami Satya Sanghananji says that once she had gone, they had invited her, please come to our house. Guruji doesn't come, at least you come on his behalf. So she had gone. There were five brothers. So she was sitting there and looking and talking, etc. One of the wives came, did pranam, went away. Sometime later, another wife came, second brother's wife. She was wondering, why is it that they are not coming in? And again, after third or fourth wife, she said, why is it they are wearing the same dress? She thought perhaps, you know, there might be uh, some tradition that they have to wear the same dress when somebody comes, etc., etc. Later on, she came to know that the situation was such that the women folk had only one sari amongst themselves. So, when one went out, the other were inside. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine the type of horror it would be? The houses, so when Swami Satya Sanghananji went and saw that, she went into a state of shock. The house was pitch dark. Nobody can see anything. And in that house, the family will stay, the cow will stay, the goat will stay. Everybody stayed in that place. But it was pitch dark. She said, why are you doing it dark? It was kept dark because if it is dark, even the thief who comes in will not see what is there. So he will not take anything away. Can you imagine people staying that way? People did not have fire. They used to keep fire in a central place and cover it. When they needed to cook, they would take something. Till very, very recently, even the leaves which would fall from the trees, Ashram had planted many trees, and anything which would fall outside, every morning you would hear people sweeping the leaves away frantically. Why? They will take those leaves and cook. That was their means of sustenance. Can you imagine people who can live that way? That was the India. Swami Satya Sanghananji, she says that we did not go into the 20th or 21st century. We had suddenly gone into the 17th century. Three centuries behind. That was the place where Swamiji went. And that was the place where he revolutionized. But not by the power of money, but by the power of spiritual strength. Swamiji said that I have implanted the seed of spirituality in you. And now it is up to you till what level you will let it blossom. And some of the children who used to come to the ashram, one is an officer in the banks, one is in police, one is an engineer, and now there are hundreds who are aspiring to be different people, including IS officers. And these are children of rikshawala, khelawala, mazdoor, 
the lowest of the low, who were thrown out of the society for whom nobody thinks. And Swamiji thought for them, not as charity, but with this thought, your pain is my pain. Your joy is my joy. And when you are sorry, I feel the pain. Not intellectually, but actually. That was the state he was in. And everything which has happened over there is a result of his sadhana. And is a sadhana in itself. And Swamiji had said many times that Rikhya is an experiment. Something which has to be taken out to the whole world. He did not do it only to help those people. But what he did is a teaching to us so that we can step up and try and emulate that. He is a great personality. But we can try and emulate not microscopic, but maybe perhaps nanoscopic effort. And if we are able to do that, his grace will come sure and certain. And when his grace comes, everything changes. Then there is that breakthrough in our life. All of us look for breakthroughs. That is the way we can get a breakthrough in our life. That is what Rikhya Agaman is all about. Those people who everybody had forgotten, for them, arrival of Swamiji was like change. Their destiny changed forever. And at Rikhya, Swamiji created something which has changed the destiny of millions of spiritual seekers. If we want to bring in that change in our lives, then we need to extend our hands and the grace comes. Then we bring that dawn of the new spiritual consciousness in our life. This is a very short glimpse of Swamiji. If I go to explain about Swamiji, I mean, That Shiva Mahimna, it is said that if Sharada, the goddess of wisdom, she starts writing about the glory of Shiva and she uses all the rivers as the ink, all the uh, ink will flow, all the ink will finish, but the glory will never end. In the same manner, what Swamiji has achieved. It is beyond words. This is just a glimpse. And for us, a glimpse is more than enough. Our eyes are not so strong that we can look at the sun. We can only have a small crack. Through the crack, we can have a small ray of light. That is all what is needed for us and what we are capable of. And that is sufficient also. It has the ability to transform our lives completely, completely. And I speak from testimony of hundreds and thousands, not just out of uh, because he is my guru or I belong to that tradition, no. Because that is what is the experience of multiple people. That is in a nutshell about Yes, Swamiji, and for us, you are that ray of light, you know, bringing uh, Sri Swamiji's words and, uh, I mean, his experience of setting up Rikhya and what you're doing in Badlapur and Pune. Uh, we completely see, uh, you know, us getting a path to kind of walk that road of uh, Sri Swamiji. Thank you so much for that. So we are almost up on time. If there are any questions or any uh, thoughts from anybody, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, talk to Swami. If there are no questions, uh, then uh, Swamiji, we will close for today. 
Let us sit with your eyes closed for a few moments. Become aware of that unending source of joy which is there within. I am the fountain. I am Sat Chit Ananda. All I have to do is connect to that. Feel that presence within. Feel the presence of a divine energy. And maintaining our awareness on this experience, we shall chant the mantra Om three times, followed by the Shanti part. Taking a deep breath. Oh. Oh. Oh, Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jotir Gamaya Mrakyor Ma Mrutam Gamaya Sarvesham Swasti Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Om Trambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Rukamiva Bandhanam Rakyor Mukshiya Mamrata Om Shanti 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 Hands in Pranamudra Swameva Mata Chapita Swameva Swameva Bandhushta Sakha Swameva Swameva Vidya Dravinam Swameva Swameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Swameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Swameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Hari Deva Gently set up your palms again, teach at us. Lay them on the floor, guys. Experience the warmth radiating from the palms, eyes, the brain, to the whole body. And then gently move your palms away from your eyes, 